Alright, thank you. How much till uh how when am I going? Happy Wednesday, Bay Area Sports Insiders, your hump day treat. Warriors, Giants, and Hockey News coming up next. All right, welcome in to Bay Area Sports Insiders. I'm your host, Courtney Cronin. Joining me now are San Francisco Giants beat writer Andrew Baggerly. Game's going on right now, but we were able to somehow sequester Andrew, to be here to talk some Giants with us, I want to remind you to submit some questions for us to answer on air, either via Twitter, Facebook, or in the live stream in the comments below. I want to thank all of those, all of you joining us on MercuryNews.com, EastBayTimes.com, and all three of our Facebook accounts. So it's been a busy, you know, really kind of a crazy time for the Giants. I mean, not the April that they expected at all, given the expectations going into this season. And we're, we're not going to get ahead of ourselves here, but they kind of are in the maybe a midst of a turnaround. Winners of five straight, looking to wrap up their first series sweep of the year, playing the Dodgers right now, as we talked about. And it seemed like a week ago they couldn't figure out, you know, anything going on with their rotation, and something seemed to finally click. What, what do you think that was? Well, first of all, thank you for having me back as a sports insider. <laughs> uh, it's been about two years since I've been an insider, but it's like riding a bike. Not a dirt yeah. bike, just a regular not bike. Like what you so did there. We'll, we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll get back in the swing of things. But but you're right. It was looking like it was going to be a very long season, and it still might be. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, they would need a win today over the Dodgers to complete a sweep. And even if they do that, they're still six under 500. Uh, you look at uh, the only team that's got a better winning streak right now in baseball is the Texas Rangers. They've won seven in a row, and that was just to get back to 500. So until the Giants can really build enough momentum to get back to the 500 mark, I think uh, you still have to look at this as a real uphill climb because uh, they've dug themselves a really deep hole. But no question, they're playing better, they're pitching mm -hmm. better, um, and they've got a little more power that they're showing now. Nine straight games with a home run with Belt and Posey coming through. So those are all good signs. Uh, and certainly they've dug themselves in a hole. They can't fly out of it, they've got to climb out of it. And if you start to slip, then you just got to climb all the more. So they got to keep it going in the right direction. And injuries obviously don't make that any easier. They've been, you know, throughout this entire early part of the season, it's just been one after the other. We're seeing former All-Stars go on the DL, and you know, this week, Hunter Pence retroactively put to the 10-day DL with that hamstring injury. It's been rough for him, given yeah. you know fifth trip on the DL since 2015 in his place. They call it Mac Williamson from AAA. 
it's just been rough. I mean, and then you yep. take a look at Mark Melanson, Bruce Bochy saying earlier on Wednesday that they are going to make him active. And we thought this would have been, maybe they would have waited till Friday. Why today? I mean, is he ready? I mean, he had the bullpen session earlier in the week. I mean, where do you kind of see that progression of, you know, why they feel like the need is right now? Well, I think that he's probably telling them, look, I'm ready to pitch. And the only reason you would activate him today is if, you would intend to use him today in a safe situation since they're off Thursday. So uh, clearly he went to them and said, look, I feel good. I feel like I can p pitch with this. Now, this is basically tendonitis. It's a pronator strain, but it more or less is what they always called elbow tendonitis. And pitchers have pitched with that for time internal. Uh, it's nothing to do with his ligament. He has had Tommy John surgery shortly after he was drafted by the Yankees. So he's a long time removed from that. Uh, and this is something that maybe he's going to have to pitch through a little bit. And that is a concern because you're in year one of a four-year deal. You don't want your closer to be pitching with elbow discomfort throughout his first full season. But getting him into safe situations, especially if this team wants to go where they're going to go, you know, they're hoping to get this guy on the mound a lot and yeah. give him a lot of save opportunities. And so uh, uh, for him to get over this hump, I think, is going to be important. With, with Pence, with a Denard Span, I think we expected to see these guys on the DL t a time or two. That, that outfield has gotten really old, very fast, and the Giants haven't done enough to replace them internally. Uh, Jarrett Parker obviously getting hurt compounded the problem. Uh, but uh, losing uh, Brandon Crawford for a week, yeah. losing Buster Posey for a week with a concussion, I mean, all you got to do is watch this team play two weeks of baseball without Brandon Crawford, and you see what a huge difference he makes. So getting those guys back and healthy, I think those are, are, are really the things that might allow this team to win some more series. And July's coming up, so the trade deadline is kind of that next thing on the horizon the Giants are going to be looking at. They've done everything so far to really, you know, to shake up the lineup, shake up the roster, you know, bringing guys like Christian Arroyo, Matt Morrison, you know, moving some pieces around mm -hmm. with Eduardo Nunez, even moving, you know, Belt out into the outfield. They're not sellers quite yet, so it's not time to just wave the white flag and, and really call the season a wash. Yeah. But where do you think they're going to be at July 31st? I mean, this is going to be one of the wildest trade, de trade deadlines we've probably seen in a few years. And they don't have a ton of pieces that they can move. I mean, they could decide to move Johnny Cueto. And get a few good prospects And get a him. few good prospects, although you even look at what Cueto netted the, the Reds, and it wasn't like, you know, uh, transformative talent that mm -hmm. they were able to get. A couple good young players. Maybe they could get Nunez. But to get Nunez, they gave up uh, Adalberto Mejia, you know, a, a sort of a middling uh, starting pitcher. So uh, I don't think they have a lot of pieces that could bring in a huge haul. Now, if they decide just to completely break it apart and say, we're going to trade a belt, we're going to trade a Joe Panic, we're going to see what we can get, we need to restock the system, maybe that's something that they would calibrate. But as you say, we've got a lot of baseball to be played until then. Mm -hmm. I think if they can find a way to get to 500 by the All-Star break, and that would mean playing six or seven above to this point. Then you look at what they've got in the second half. They start the second half at San Diego, and you know they should take a series against the Padres. Mm -hmm. Then they come home. 20 out of the next 23 are in the Bay Area, including a couple of games against the A's. And if they could get to 500 by that point, then maybe they could see that as a real liftoff point where they could turn themselves back into contenders, and maybe they aren't selling pieces at the trade deadline. Matt Cain, if you looked maybe the other day, you probably thought, what, was this 2014? Did I blink in? We went back in the mm -hmm. future. He reached 2,000 innings, uh, pitched on Monday against the Dodgers. That was 112, uh, 112 pitches there. He goes from a guy who was you know, a three-time All-Star to fighting to get that number five spot mm -hmm. in the starting rotation. And the Giants are you know, finally seeing him go back to being that workhorse that he was. You know, just his struggles this season. And if he, are the training wheels going to be let off anytime soon by Bruce Bochy? Well, I think A, Bumgarner's out. Um, B, uh, Tyler Beattie is having a few bumps at, at AAA. Mm -hmm. uh, if Beattie were blowing doors off the way that Christian Arroyo did uh, at the mm -hmm. plate in his first month, then I think maybe they would uh, think more start to start. But they were very, very uh, um, big believers in Matt Cain the entire time when mm -hmm. You know, people in the media, a lot of fans were like, hey, let's kick this guy to the curb. We saw this with Linscombe. We saw this with Zito. Mm -hmm. Let's not just, because we're paying him $20 million, throw him out there every fifth day. And, and Bruce Bochy would tell, tell you, on the record, off the record, we believe in this guy. We think that he can do it. And I think that he's realized that there are times when he can get people out, out of the strike zone before he was just pumping as many strikes as he could. And I think you see him pitching a little bit more and, and, and fighting a little bit more. And he does have to get lucky from time to time. He got a couple of double play grounders uh, mm -hmm. that were very well uh, placed uh, in his last start that helped him get through. But yeah, the, the more he can get it rolling, the more his confidence will start to pick up. And I think that's the biggest thing. Once he's confident and he's out there and he knows he can stand tall on that mound again, mm -hmm. uh, then I think that he can be a very serviceable pitcher in the rotation, maybe not an ace, 
but uh, that's not what they're requiring of it. Okay, some questions coming through right now from social media. This one from DW Rhonda. Why haven't the Giants revisited discussing Kelby Tomlinson as an outfield solution? Well, I think they're looking at Tom. They just sent Tomlinson out today, actually, mm -hmm. to, to make room for Mark Melanson on the, on the roster. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they like Kelby. They think that he's a guy who can probably contribute more in the, on the, in the infield. Um, you know, they're looking for, I think, a little more power in the lineup, and they like Eduardo Nunez in there every day. And now if they've got Christian Arroyo at third base, well, then Nunez is going to play left field. And he did not look very good in left field, but I think he's one of those guys where the more reps he gets, the better he'll get. And I think we've already seen that a little bit. All right. Big weekend coming up for you. You're hitting the road with the Giants, going to see Mark Melanson possibly, you know, as we say, activated today. They want to get him ready for that road trip beginning in St. Louis this Friday. And then to your neck of the woods, and Chicago. To our neck of the yes. woods, Mr. Northwestern grad. <laughs> exactly. All righty. That'll do it for Andrew Baggerly. Up next, Mark Purdy to talk about the Warriors, who are now headed down to San Antonio with a 2-0 lead in the Western Conference Finals. If you watch the game, on Tuesday night, you probably thought that you were, you know, in the middle of January or middle of February, given the 36-point blowout for the Warriors against the Spurs. Warriors were able to do that with the use of a very deep bench going all the way down to rookie Patrick McCaw in place of Andre Iguodala. I mean, Mark, it's been, it's been tough for the Spurs. I mean, you see the last few days, 48 hours, all the vitriol, he's got his basketball here, so he's ready. All the vitriol spewed at Zaza Pachulia, the playoff theater, all of that. You know, is this series effectively over? I mean, you take a look at what happened last night yeah. and just how the Warriors crushed from, from, from top that, to bottom. I think, sir, can you? I can catch. Okay. You, you got to throw uh, back? Okay. Got to get on my finger? I, yo, you're good. It, <laughs> if I, if I, uh, if I, uh, Give a bad answer, just throw it at my face. Okay, Meanwhile, gotcha. we can just keep. <laughs> <laughs> um, can keep doing that. I, you know what? The series to answer your questions. I think the series was over after game one. I think game one was the Spurs' chance to maybe win the series, and they got ahead by 20 points, and they couldn't close it out. And I think from that point on, the, the Spurs were not going to win uh, four of the remaining six games. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. You just don't do that to the Warriors. Uh, the, the, the theatrical stuff has been interesting, but we've seen that in other NBA series. It gave us something to write about. Would you call, would you call and it? And it also allowed me to type Zaza many times, which I enjoy. Would you call that manslaughter? Or is that a little <laughs> bit of, that's, to me, I was videotaping it and I'm surprised that my gasp did not pick up after he said yeah. that because that was kind of right. out of control. Right. Well, uh, I think the NBA has an issue with that play, but the way that play has been called mm -hmm. all year, Zaza did exactly what he's been doing all year and what others have done all year. And uh, that's just, you kind of just don't, you aren't that careful. You, yeah. you, you run the play. There's no way he purposely meant to injure. It's like a, it's like a uh, second base slide in baseball. The guy comes into second base to get to second base. He doesn't probably mean to hurt the other guy, but often he hurts the other guy. And, the, and, and then it's up to, I guess, the umpire to decide was there intent there or not. So uh, this, I, I know, give me the ball back. Uh, this, <laughs> this is what I think. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's, it's science has proven it is impossible to measure intent in anyone named Zaza. That's that's fair. Yeah, I like I like that, and and that brings up a bigger point: how the NBA is going to you know really protect its three point shooters. This has been an issue that over the last you know really decade yeah. has we continue to see the three shot foul um, you know rise, and and it, it prompted me to go back and watch Bruce Bowen highlights of when. I think Vince Carter was going to kill him at one point after I kept rewatching that. that would have been he manslaughter. Did this, that <laughs> would have been manslaughter. Actually, it would have been homicide, yeah. but, you know, semantics. Um, so we take a look at stuff like that, and, and it happened last night. It was brought up again mm -hmm. to Kevin Durant. LaMarcus Aldridge sticking the foot out just right. slightly. Right. And Kevin Durant said, you know, this is one of the cleanest players in the league, one of the most well-respected players in the league. You know, bigs aren't used to guarding guys on the perimeter. Can we go ahead and leave it at that and just call it reckless? No, I think the NBA has to do something. I think they have to just make it a point of emphasis with the officials uh, that be careful or be, be extra zeroed in on that play and, and err on the side of keeping the players safe. I think that's what will happen in the offseason. You won't see a change in the playoffs, um, even if LeBron James get hurt. But uh, you can, you know, Zaza Pachulia, he does things in a big way, you know. When he when he inadvertently injured Kevin Durant mm -hmm. this year, he was 
responding to somebody shoving him, and he did that in a big way, whether you say he was embellishing or not. He's just a big, do we, can we say galoot? Can we say galoot on TV? I think so. I don't I think mean, it's you know, a He's just a big galoot, and he's, uh, things like that are going to happen. All right, so the Warriors bench is... How about a bounce pass? I can do that. Okay, okay. Can, can we do the pick and roll? Yeah. No, we, I don't know if we've got enough room right. here to do that. But okay. anyways, all right, so the bench last night on Tuesday, huge performance, what we saw from top to bottom there. And the way that this Warriors team is built, you have a replacement. And Andre Iguodala is a luxury to have in the first place. Six-man mm -hmm. uh, NBA Finals MVP in 2015. And then you have him in his spot and a Patrick McCaw, 6'7 wing right. defender, who as a rookie is earning probably his best minutes in the playoffs or playing his, most, his best basketball. Isn't that crazy? It is crazy. Hey, if you're watching on YouTube or we would Facebook, love, we would love tell to us, have some tell questions. Us, do you think, how crazy is that? <laughs> that was a good one. I like that you set that up perfectly. I mean, Thank how you. crazy is it, though? I mean, you take a look. They have depth for the depth, almost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, the, the roster's been put together very well for a long playoff run. Uh, that's part of the skill of putting together a team. Mm -hmm. When you put together a team, you're not thinking of just December and January. You're thinking of also what might happen here and what, what you know, giving, giving your coach options mm -hmm. to, uh, to and, and the Warriors have options. Now, uh, you know, if one of the really big guys gets hurt, we may mm -hmm. be talking about something. But uh, so far that hasn't happened. And the fact that the Warriors are winning these series pretty easily with only, in only four games, I think this one maybe will go five, maybe. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's games they don't play are games in which they can't get hurt. Yeah, and so the series does go down to San Antonio for Game Three, and what we saw in Game One I'm was gonna kind come of under rare. You. I'm going to come under you like the like. You're going to you're like, just going to move the set, okay? No, All right, he's gonna, gonna, now I'm, he's going to kick my feet out. No, that's so right. are those Air Court Air they're, Coronas? They're, they're Jordan. They five hundred dollars? No, they were they were. Oh, okay. I wear kid sizes because it's cheaper actually. Oh, so okay. that is a point of reference okay. for you when when this becomes you know if you ever want to go buy some. Okay, but. Where was I? <laughs> I was talking about I'm my Jordan. To you. I and, now, and now we've got I this. I apologize to the viewers. But anyway, so in game one, we saw Curry and Durant yeah. on the same page. Yeah. A lot of times it's one person on one night, the other on another night. Curry yeah. has 40, Durant has 34. Are we going to see that again? Maybe not in this series because you say it's effectively I, over. You've called it over. Yeah, but. yeah, yeah. I, well, it's, you know, what, what a great thing to have. I mean, if you need them, they'll be there. Mm -hmm. I think that's what we see. If you need them, they'll be there. If you don't need them, they don't have to. The other guys can do that. I think Clay Thompson does need to have a game where he gets his mojo back. He was a little close, yeah. kind of somewhat close last night. Uh, he's, he's always there defensively. Good. Yeah, he's, he's always there defensively. But at some point, I think they're going to need him. Um, I, you know, that, that first game, I, I, we've answered the question a lot of people had mm -hmm. about Durant. Can he and Curry coexist? I think they can. What do you think? <laughs> we, what do you think, YouTube? <laughs> can they coexist? Can we find peace? Yeah, of course we can. Yeah. You don't need an, you don't need an answer. But uh, I, 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 you know, that's that was so impressive that those two guys. I love watching their interaction now. I love watching them play together. Uh, and I wasn't sure if I, I wrote it at the time. I wasn't sure if this would be like too many candy. Pieces of candy, too many pieces of rich candy in a dish, and the and there's and it no can such make, thing. It can make yes, it can. Yes, there is because I've I've eaten too much candy in a dish and made me sick. I I, I don't. I, I you worry about that because you see that happen on college teams, yeah. Courtney. You know they'll recruit all these great guys and then the team. What happened is because the personalities, the talent's great, but the personalities don't mix. My alma uh, mater in 2012, among others. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, you know these two guys who, when they were doing the research or whoever was doing it, and, and really it was up to Curry. Curry's the guy who had to decide on this. Uh, their, their personalities mesh, and it's, uh, it's been a beautiful thing to watch. All right, let's jump forward really quick to the Eastern Conference Finals, which it feels like they ha the, 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 the Cavs haven't played in about three months. It's been 10 days. No one's giving Boston much of a fighting chance in this, even though they are the one seed, but the Cavs the overwhelming favorite there as a number two seed. Is this over? I mean, are they, are they going to sleep? <laughs> we, we, we just well, go ahead and throw speak, the towel yeah, in? Again. If, if, if there, it's a fighting chance. If they actually fight them. Okay. I like that Olenek guy. He's mm -hmm. a big He's a big galoot. Yeah. Who, who, YouTube, who's the bigger galoot, Pachulia or Olenek? <laughs> I, I, I think we'll have the answer. Oh, God. But, uh, you know, it's gonna. I think it'll be someone interesting. Mm -hmm. Brad Stevens is a good coach, the, the sauce coach. I, I'm interested to see how they try to defend uh, uh, LeBron James. He'll probably throw Crowder. He'll probably try a number of smart number of people on there. Um, but I can't see Boston win, winning more than one game, mm -hmm. probably at home. 
And it may even be the first game, and I'll still say Cleveland's going to win. I mean, LeBron James, who's really coaching the Cavaliers, um, will he'll draw up all the right plays. And uh, and as we saw again, you know, one of the most amazing things I saw the year the Warriors won the championship two seasons ago mm -hmm. was some of those games James would just take over himself. It, it, it was astounding to watch. Um, and now he's got you know Irving's healthy again, and I, I, it, it'll be. It'll be a five-game series or less. June 1st. Can't get here soon enough. Only, June 1st. Only a few weeks away. Really quick, we're going to get into one Twitter question, which actually is about, it's a hockey question, so it's going to tee up our next segment there with Paul Gackle. This one from Mark Allen. Do you think the Sharks are in the market for a big headliner trade using core personnel like Couture or, and or Pavel, Pavelski? No. <laughs> so that's, I, that's I a just, quick answer. No, I, 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 think, I think those two guys, Couture and Pavelski, mm -hmm. are two guys. Uh, I remember talking to the general manager of the Sharks a few years ago and saying, well, in the year 2020, who are your centers? Mm -hmm. And those were two guys he mentioned that were, in his mind, were going to be with the team in 2020 playing center. So, so no. And also, the Sharks have salary cap issues. Bringing in another, a big name with a big salary mm -hmm. are, are, is going to be tough. But ask Paul Gackle. Yeah. And He'll that, be here soon. And that's what we are about to get into. Yeah. I want to thank Mark Purdy for joining us here on Bay Area Sports Insiders. As he mentioned, if you do have questions, be sure to throw them out at us using the hashtag BA Sports Insiders on Twitter and Facebook. Paul Gackle will be joining us shortly. The San Jose Sharks kicked off what is the start of a very busy offseason and upcoming summer months by re-signing restricted free agent forwards Melker Carlson and and Jonas Donskoy. The deals reportedly were six million for Carlson and three point eight million for Donskoy. Paul, this is so important to do now, ahead of what is gonna be a crazy off season period for the Sharks. I didn't know I was supposed to bring a prop today, Corey. No, you could have brought, your, brought yeah. my stick, cross check maybe. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> Mark Purdy, he's the carrot top of sports columnists, I guess. <laughs> Like, I don't know. Does that make me Chandler Bing's what they're telling me? So, well, yeah, they wanted to get this out of the way. Look, they have a lot on their plate this summer. Patrick Marlowe and Joe Thornton becoming unrestricted free agents. Chris Tierney's a restricted free agent. They're going to want to extend him. Mm -hmm. Marcus Sorensen, a guy who played a bunch of games up in the in the NHL late in the season, they're going to bring him back. And Michael Haley's an unrestricted free agent. So with all these moving parts, and you also have the expansion draft coming up. Not sure what's going to come or go in that. You kind of want to get the, a couple pieces locked down early. And it, they got pretty good deals with, with both of these players. Malcolm Carlson's a nice mm -hmm. player to have at $2 million for three years. Giannis Donskoy coming off a bit of a sophomore slump. So they probably got him at a bargain rate deal at $1.9 million for two years. But it's nice to get that off their plate. Now they mm -hmm. have a little more of a sense of what they're working with when the heavy lifting comes up here in the summer. And as you mentioned, with, with, with Thornton and Marlowe, those are the big names that have been thrown out for months. We knew this was coming. With the summer months, I mean, last year in the Bay Area, the big blockbuster was Kevin Durant. Do we see a blockbuster likely here in the Bay Area in hockey this summer? Well, the Sharks are going to be one of the more interesting teams to watch in the National Hockey League this summer just because those two vets who have been really the identity of this team for so long, they're going to be unrestricted free agents. But I'm here to tell you that a major shakeup is really, really highly unlikely. And I know that fans are sort of hoping for a change of blood out there, and they see those two big names heading to market, and they go, well, why can't we swap those guys out for some younger core players? And it's just really not that easy. When you add up the numbers with those guys, it's going to be about $13.4 million in salary that that's going to loosen up. But another big priority for Doug Wilson this summer is extending the contracts of defense and Mark Edward Vlasic and goalie Martin Jones. So some of that money is going to have to come out of there. Vlasic, he, he's the best defensive defenseman in the game. He shut down Connor McDavid in that first round series. He's been invited to Team Canada's Olympic team for a reason. He's only making 4.2. He has a mm -hmm. lot of legitimate reason to say, hey, I deserve $8 million like Brent Burns is making. Probably, maybe they can negotiate on about seven, but you're looking at giving him about three more million. Martin Jones is going to go up to about five and a half to six million. That's three more million for Martin Jones. So right there, you're losing six million. Um, so it is going to be really tight, as Mark Purdy mentioned. So it's, it gets really hard to make a blockbuster deal just because of the numbers going back and forth. And then also finding a dance partner because mm -hmm. everybody else in the NHL is dealing with similar constrictions uh, around the salary cap. So while yeah. that sounds nice, 
I just don't really see it being able to work out, the numbers being able to work out. I will say if there's one move that I think where I see the dance partners maybe shaking down is Matt Duchesne has two years left on a $6 million contract. He's a center for the Colorado Avalanche. He's also played for the Canadian Olympic team. You know, he's a big-time young center in this league. And if they could maybe part ways with either Marlowe or, Thor or Thornton, I could see maybe a scenario where they have the parts that Colorado wants because the mm -hmm. Sharks do have an overload of young talent in their farm system. That's why the AHL Barracuda have been so good this year. So they might be able to work something out with Colorado. That's about the only blockbuster I can see happening. All right, salary cap, when, when numbers come up, my brain goes out. So we're going to get to the Barracuda right now. Did you get all that? I mean, I, I know I, I, that's I, like... Uh, be sure to, yeah, if you have more questions about that, you can throw them in at Paul uh, using that hashtag BA Sports Insiders on Facebook and on Twitter. But yeah, it's, it's obviously a big summer for them, and it's a busy summer. But coming up this weekend, the Calder Cup, the Sharks AHL affiliate, the San Jose Barracuda, of advancing to their first Final Four in Calder Cup playoffs for the first time in history. 19 AHL seasons, 1,560 regular season games, a league record, 691 career wins wins for Barracuda head coach Roy Summer. That's a pretty big accomplishment. Yeah, it's an exciting day for the Sharks franchise. I mean, obviously the Sharks haven't won a Stanley Cup yet, but this year maybe they have an opportunity to do something a little bit different with their their um, young team, their, their, the baby Sharks as they like to call them, look like they could really make a push and win a championship this year. You know, they were around the 700 points percentage mark all year. Like I said, just a bunch of young draft picks that they've sort of hit on over the last few years. They've, they're all sort of coming together at once down there. So right now, you know, down with the Barracuda, you can see Timo Meyer, who is the Sharks um, first round pick in 2015, ninth overall. Marcus Sorensen, like I said, had a big impact with the Sharks late in the year. Mm -hmm. He's down there. Kevin LeBanc, 50 plus games with the Sharks. He's down there. And a couple of, you know, up and comers like Danny O'Regan, Tim Heed, Joachim Ryan. They have the goalie of the year in uh, Troy Grosnick. So a lot of exciting things happening. Mm -hmm. They will take on the Grand Rapids Griffins. Mm -hmm in the Western Conference Final Game 1 Saturday night, Game 2 on Sunday. And Ryan Carpenter's been killing it. And Ryan too. Carpenter yeah. is just destroying the league. They're, see, see look, my knowledge. All over, see? you're all over I'm the all A. over this. We <laughs> knew you were following the A so closely. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I believe it's 13 points mm -hmm. in 11 games top in score. the playoffs. Top score in the Calder Cup playoffs, tops yeah. and goals, tops and plus minus, doing a little bit of everything. Unrestricted free agent coming up at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. Highly likely you'll see him in the National Hockey League. Good chance he'll be playing somewhere elsewhere. All right, we've got some Twitter questions coming in. I want to get to them before we wrap up here. This one from David L. Bernard, or Barnard. Do you see them, meaning the San Jose Sharks, extending Vlasic before addressing Thornton and or Marlowe? I think we kind of touched on that. But the order of things here, how does that happen? Well, you know, probably that's going to come after. Mm -hmm. uh, more than likely, you want to see what's going on with Patrick Marlowe and Thornton first, and then you can kind of see what's left over for the guys like Vlasic and Jones. So my expectation is we'll see the Thornton and Marlowe contract. Hit first. Okay, Peter, Pete DeBoer War, what high-end players could you see the Sharks targeting via a trade? Well, we kind of talked about that as well. I, you know, people are talking about John Tavares. He's going to okay. be the big um, free agent that's coming up next summer. Mm -hmm. Look, the Islanders are already offering him $10 million a year over eight years. The Sharks just don't have that kind of loose money to play with to acquire a player like him. Uh, they already have $8 million tied up in Brent Burns, and you see with the Chicago Blackhawks, you start adding too many of those guys, it really hurts your depth el elsewhere. That's why I say a guy like uh, Matt Duchesne, who's an mm -hmm. Olympic caliber center at $6 million a year, that seems a little more likely. All right, that's going to do it for us on this episode of Bay Area Sports Insiders. Thank you to all of you who submitted questions. Hopefully we answer them. If not, be sure to give Paul, Andrew, and Mark Purdy a follow on Twitter, and you can ask them there. We'll be back over the weekend, actually, as we all head down to San Antonio for games three and four of the Western Conference Finals in the NBA, not to be confused with the other conference finals going on in hockey. So be sure to check out those segments coming up on Saturday and Monday, and we will see you back here next time.